So let's take a look at one pipe hydronic systems. It's a bunch of them. This was a fun job. I was on this with uh, with my friend uh, Al Levy, who writes for Plumbing Mechanical Magazine. That's Al's hand right there. This is back when he was still in his family's uh, oil oil and uh, contracting business. And we were on this job in a person's house where Al was there because the boiler had actually dissolved and he was replacing it. Somebody else had done the work before him. But to figure out why they had no heat in this bathroom that was upstairs, he had to uh, tear down the ceiling and, and we find this diverter T and a standard T. And this, this piping goes from here all the way upstairs to the bathroom and then it goes back down to where Al was. So they didn't have they didn't have any heat up there in the bathroom. So Al and I are looking at this and we're saying, okay, imagine your water. If you were water and you're flowing down this line, uh, would you go from here to here, even though there's a, a diverter T in there, or would you choose to go up this pipe all the way up to the second floor and then all the way back down to this T? What would you do if you were the water? And the answer was was pretty clear. You know, we'd, we'd stay in the pipe. So so that was a problem. Where, where there is no flow, there is no heat. So if there's no water flowing up to the radiator, obviously there's going to be a cold bathroom. So the guy that was there before Al uh, told the woman that uh, you know he'd come back and bleed the radiator, which he did again and again and again. But each time he bled it, the radiator would get hot because he's not actually bleeding the radiator. He's draining the system through the radiator. But then when he left, it would get cold again. And, and also while he's, while he's bleeding, he's not getting any air. So once again, if I don't get any air, it ain't an air problem. So I really should stop bleeding at that point. But this guy was persistent. So he got to a point where he said to the woman, I'm not coming back anymore. And he installed that boiler drain that you see here. And he left it with about four feet of, of a hose, like a washing machine hose. And he said, when, listen, whenever you want heat, just put the hose in the bathtub and open this valve and run some water and the radiator will get hot. So the woman said, okay, well, you know, I, I like to take a bath every night. I'm not a shower person. I, I love laying in the bath. And would it be okay for me to fill the tub up through that same hose? And the guy said, well, I don't see why not. It all comes from the same place. But he's, he's not considering that uh, it's probably not the best idea to, to fill a, a, a bathtub with water from the wrong side of a boiler, not not through the tankless coil side, but from the cast iron side. So she did this for a while, and, and she noticed as time went by that the water was turning color uh, from the corrosion. And she called the guy back and said, you know, the, the water's got a, a strange color to it. And he didn't want to go back anymore. So he said to her, well, that's that's minerals. That that's, that's good for you. It's good for your skin. You know, people travel from all over to go to places like Saratoga and Hot Springs, Arkansas. And here you got it right in your own house. So... Uh, so she, she went for that until the boiler failed through oxygen corrosion, and, and that's where Al got involved. So uh, we learned a few things about these wonderful devices that we call diverter tees. If you don't get any air, it ain't an air problem. Stop bleeding. Diverter tees go back to the 1940s or so, and you know as we know them today, and the direction of flow is this way. And we used them back then in the 50s on, on convectors, which were about three feet wide. And they always put the piping to and from the convector, the width of the convector, to increase the pressure drop along the run here so that water would divert through and onward. It's kind of like the OS fitting, the Oliver Schlemmer fitting of the old days. Notice too that uh, we put the diverter, uh, the diverter T on the return side, not on the supply side, when we're just using one of them. That's so that it creates kind of a traffic jam up ahead and the water will go on the service road to the convector and carry on to the next radiator. Bell and Gossett made them, Taco made them. Both of them used these rings to show you which way to put them in. Bell and Gossett painted theirs red. And the goal here was to get the red ring, or the, the blank ring in the case of Taco, inboard of the pipes that go to your radiator. So if you're using just a return side monoflow T, that's B&G's trademark, it would be turned this way. So the water coming down looks ahead, and it looks like there's a traffic accident up there. The lanes are closed. So some of the water says, well, I'm not going to wait. I'm going to get on the service road and go around. So that's the way it works. If we were feeding up to a second floor like, in, like we were in that bathroom, or if we were feeding down into a basement, we'd use two of these T's. And in this case, the red rings always have to be inboard. So notice how one T is facing in that direction, and the other T is the reverse. It's facing this way. So the goal here is to create a great pressure drop along the run so that more water diverts 
up the service road through the convector and back into the mainstream. So sometimes we need one T, sometimes we need two. On downfeed, they always use two, supposed to use two. In fact, some of the old timers would stagger them like that, supply return, supply return, to give us even more pressure drop along the run to drive water down. Because the hot water does not want to go down and the cold water does not want to come up. So we've got to kind of help it along if we're coming off a basement main that's feeding down to convectors or baseboard that's in the radiator. And by the way, if, if you're uh, looking at an old style 1950s convector and you think it, it looks old and you're take them off, uh, taking it off the main like you see here and you decide to put in baseboard, you may just remember you may not get any flow through that baseboard because if you put in 30 feet of baseboard or so, you're adding that much more resistance to flow than you have here. So these are supposed to be spaced the width of the radiator apart and you got to kind of keep the pressure drop through the radiator to a minimum to induce flow. If it's not heating, chances are there's no flow going to it. It's not air. So let's think about a builder back in those days building those houses in the 1950s. Direction of flow goes that way. You want it to go down to the radiator and come up and let's say that's a 10,000 BTU radiator or, or convector. Now, 10,000 BTUs working with a 20 degree temperature drop, well that's equivalent to one gallon per minute. So we want one gallon per minute to go down and one gallon per minute to come up. Now in the main up here, this is a three quarter inch main. So the most water you're gonna fit through a three quarter inch main without having a problem is four GPM in hydronics. Anything more than that, you're gonna get noise. So going back to what Gil Carlson said years ago, whatever goes into a T must come out. If four GPM goes in this way, and one goes down, well then obviously the common piping is carrying 3 GPM because whatever goes in must come out. 3 GPM then joins with the 1 GPM to get us back to 4. Now suppose to make that happen, the manufacturer says you must use two of these diverter T's, one pointing one way, the other pointing the other way. But the builder figures he wants to cheat a little bit, so he says, what if I leave out one of these T's? Who's going to notice? All the walls are going to be closed up. So he does that. Now if he leaves out one of the T's, you're not going to have as much pressure drop along this primary flow. So you're going to get more than 3 GPM here, right? Maybe you get 3.5 GPM. And if you got 3.5 GPM flowing this way, because that T is not there to divert it, then you can't possibly get 1 GPM down here, right? 3.5 plus 1, you, you, you got to wind up with 4. So this gets cut in half. So instead of having 1 GPM, you've got a half GPM. Now the big question is, is that enough to heat the room? The convector is sized for 10,000 BTUs. Can you do that with the half GPM? Well, 10,000 BTUs is the heat that you need on the coldest day of the year. So on a milder day, the half GPM may get the job done, but it's on that cold day that you're going to get cold because that's when this radiator can seem to heat the room because it's just putting in maybe 5,000 BTUs instead of the 10,000 BTUs that you need on the design day. But when you go down and you feel that convector, this side's going to feel hot and the other side's going to feel cold and that's going to look just like an air problem to you and you're going to be compelled to bleed that radiator and when you bleed the radiator the radiator will get hot eventually because you'll have changed this flow rate back to 1 GPM by draining the radiator. But keep in mind that you're probably not going to see any air while you're doing this so and again if you don't get any air it ain't an air problem so just know that these balance problems look just like air problems and don't get fooled. This is from Bell & Gossett's design manual from the 1940s. They're showing a, a 10,000 BTU radiator on the first floor and another one on the second floor. And it's the same radiator, but the difference is on the first floor, it only needs one half inch monoflow fitting to work. That would be on the return side. But if we move that radiator up to the second floor, because the run to it is longer and the run back from it is longer, we'd have to increase the pipe size to three quarter and use two three quarter inch monoflow T's down here, even though it's the exact same radiator. So this is the problem that Al and I had in that bathroom that wouldn't heat. They didn't have enough monoflow T's down here to induce the flow up into the radiator. That's what we had to do. Add that second monoflow to make the thing work. So location, location, location. It matters with these one pipe systems that we call monoflow or venturi flow. Thermostatic radiator valves seem like a, a good item to have if you've got this type of radiator and you want with the monoflow T and you want to you want to zone it. Now thermostatic radiator valve is kind of neat because it's not electric. 
It has this temperature sensitive head that's filled with a wax or a liquid that's going to sense the air temperature and put pressure on this normally open spring loaded valve to meter the water that goes through that convector. But what you have to watch out for when you're buying these for monoflow systems or diverter T systems is what's called a CV because they would the TRV would go right there. But you got to look at this thing called C CV, which is in the catalog, as you see here in the Honeywell catalog. It says CV equals 2.5 for the half inch valve and 2.7 for the three quarter inch valve. CV is an engineering term and CV is always read as a number. And what it is, is the amount of, of water in GPM, the flow of water in GPM that causes a one pound pressure drop across that valve. The so CV you'll see pop up in a lot of things. It's, it's given for packaged equipment. It's given for all kinds of valving. And once we know the pressure drop at one PSI, we could figure out the pressure drop at any flow rate or the flow rate at any pressure drop. So if I, would, if I were selecting for a system with monoflow tees, I would want to have a CV that is very, very high, as high as possible, meaning that the higher the CV, the lower the pressure drop. Because just by putting the valve in, wide open, it's liable to create enough of a pressure drop so that there's no flow at all going through the radiator. So be careful with that. A lot of people put in baseboard and they run it from room to room or from office to office on one long continuous loop. And then you wonder, is it possible to use thermostatic radiator valves in a loop like this? Could I put that in? And your first reaction might be, well, if I put that in, it's going to shut down this room and shut off the flow to every other room. So you might say, well, we can't do that. But one of the things about hydronics is you can pretty much do anything as long as you think it through. And the way to think it through here is if you've got baseboard element, you want to use thermostatic radiator valves, just run a smaller bypass. If this is three quarter inch baseboard, put a half inch unfinned bypass loop around it. So when the TRV starts to throttle, the excess water, instead of going through the fin tube element, will go around it and onto the next room and so on and so forth. Nice way to get the job done. So some startup tips before we leave these diverter tees. First of all, if, if you're doing a boiler and you're changing the boiler, always pump away because that's going to give you the full discharge pressure of your circulator on the system and that's going to increase the pressure which will cause those small bubbles that are up in the system to get smaller. They'll get crushed and they'll be swept back and spit out so you'll have an easier time. If you, if you pump away from the boiler, you will never again bleed a radiator. Trust me on that. So pump away if you can. If you can, if you're working on a job where you know you're just making some repairs and and you drain the system and now you got to get it going again if it's the flow control valve that has a that has a crank on it where you can lift the weight by all means lift the weight to take that away from the pressure drop of the system and that will help you get the thing started up again see the problem with the diverter t system is when you're purging it you're purging through the main lines it doesn't necessarily want to purge through the branch lines especially if they're up on the second floor or down in the basement so that gives you, once you've drained the system, a difficult time filling it up again. Pitch the main up half inch and 10 feet so air doesn't get trapped along the way. That's a rule that goes back to the very beginning when these things were first invented. And raise the pressure and lower the temperature at the same time. This was taught to me by an old time oil heat service manager on Long Island that was working in an area where they had a lot of these systems and they went into service and they just drained the system and had to get it going again right away. And so they worked with... Uh, with Henry's law that says gases dissolve in liquid in proportion to pressure and temperature. So this this fellow Howie, who was the service manager, said to me, they'll go in there and lower the temperature, because when water gets cooler, it tends to absorb more air, and then they would raise the pressure almost up to 30 PSI, because as you raise the pressure, the water will absorb more air. And by doing that, that's often enough to give them a kickstart to get the thing going. And when all else fails, you could do what another old timer taught me. I wouldn't really take this advice, but I got to share it with you. He said that uh, he never spent no money on any of those expensive teas. He just used standard teas. And I said, well, how did you get the water to flow through the radiator if you're just using standard teas? He says, well, you take the copper tubing between the teas and you squeeze it, crush it with the pliers. I said, how much do you crush it? He says, well, that depends. He says, but you better, you better do it right, kid, because you only get one shot at it. So, <laughs> so I wouldn't take his advice, but I share it with you because there's a lot of people out there in this industry who are comical.